Welcome to everyone here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Bernard uh, Pettenbach in a minute, but I just wanted to say a couple of things about kind of housekeeping. Uh, we shut off the chat room during the reading just so that we have a little uh, silence around that, but we'll be opening it up at the end of the reading. Welcome your comments and um, We'll also invite you to stick around afterward and engage. I'll unmute everybody and we can have a discussion or just say hello. So, okay, turning it over to Bernard now, one of the editors of the Eco Poetics Anthology. Um, hello, uh, everyone. Um, I'm Bernie Quetchenbach and I am uh, going to welcome you briefly and uh, so welcome and thanks to all of you for participating. Thanks to the readers and thanks to Cole for helping us get this set up. Um, so with that in mind, I'm just give you a little background on the project itself. Uh, so the Poetics for the More Than Future World Anthology began as a dispatches website issue and expanded into the full-fledged anthology. Um, it's co-edited by Mary Newell. Sarah Nolan, uh, I don't think, I don't know if Sarah's here, Mary oh, is here. Sorry, <laughs> oh, it's me, my bad, I turned, I'm turning my phone off. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably Sarah calling now. Uh, so uh, uh, Mary and Sarah and myself, um, and we look for ecologically convergent writing that aspires to expand beyond the anthropocentric, uh, anthropocentric perspective Beyond that, we welcomed innovative strategies and varied voices that confront ecological challenges on various scales and correspond to or aim to evoke a view of interconnectedness among the varied species that share the planet. Uh, we welcomed work. Uh, anyway, the anthology is on its way to being reduced, reduced to being um, released by Spite and Dival Press. And uh, you can get information on pre ordering at the website of Spite and Dival Press. Right. So I'm just going to say the names of the readers and uh, after each reading, I'll say the next name. Right. So uh, the first reader is Orchid Tierney. Hey, all. Thank you so much for in, um, inviting me. And I just want to say thanks to the editors uh, uh, for putting together this marvelous anthology. Um, and also thanks to Cole for, for um, your extraordinarily organizational efforts bringing us all, all here together today. Um, I, I, I just want to sort of point out a couple of th things. Um, this background image that I have um, on my Zoom is from a work on progress uh, called Touch. Um, because I'm really fascinated by how how all our touch is really temporary and lethal, particularly during this period of COVID age. Um, but I've also been sort of thinking a lot about how white touch is specifically um, dangerous and grotesque, specifically for, for I think, for people of colour right now, um, who have been really violently manhandled by um, the regimes of law and order. So today I just want to sort of like leave here on the open that I'm really thinking about Aliyah McLean, Breonna uh, Taylor, George Floyd, um, who've just been sort of, you know, their lives have been just been sort of like snuffed out from by white supremacy. And I really want to encourage everyone today to to donate um, to bail fund, but to the bail project um, dot org or to um, the Black Lives Black Black Lives Matter um, movement. Um, that's it's very much with me today. Um, I'm going to just read just one poem. Um, from the anthology called An Ode, An Odor. And just to sort of like explain a little bit, um, the poem has um, two alternating voices, one that's represented in regular italics, uh, sorry, regular typeface, and the other in italics. Um, and the italics is the secondary mediated poetic voice. Um, um, but since I'm reading this poem by myself, I'm just gonna read the primary voice, which is uh, in regular typeface, um, which is a more investigative, um, pseudo-scientific voice that is supposed to clash with the poetic, um, the poetic voice. And before I begin, can I just get a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Perfect. I'll try and read as, um, as articulated um, as I possibly can. I believe Zoom does have captions, so if you actually are struggling um, to, to hear me, um, you can activate the ca captions via your preferences, um, but I'm also happy to provide a copy of the poem 
as well. So you have um, you have it. Some ode odor. Methanobacterium uh, are whose sense is a salty stretch, a sweet scratch, a bad egg and flatus. In fact, it is a non-motile, mesophilic, halophilic and finical filamentous microbe that thrives best at temperatures of 45 degrees Celsius. In 2004, scientists had isolated the strain in marine samples collected from below the sediment surface in Aarhus Bay a waterway on the Danish coast of Jutland. They described their cultivated colonies as circular and grayish, surrounded by a whitish zone. They said these cells are indecisive, straight or crooked, lonely or coupled, filaments or clumpy. They enjoy intimacy to particles, make methane, haunt hydrogen, convert energy, share kinship with similar metho methanogenic archaea. In fact, novel organisms. In fact, microscopic and occultic. In fact, occultic because beautiful, but ugly and modern too. Because between five and 18 micrometers long, methane bacterium are liminal and leaky, but not ghost nor spirit, but bond and brine. Gnome, not guest, matter and materialized through the metaphor making of electron microscopes and whitish zones. But however nominal these microbe organisms are, they stay sticky and silent, a small thing in fact, easily washed away and hidden underneath sediment strata. Ephemeral too, because they're nothing like we're something, but ready to cut skins, organs, even rotten eggs when they quietly surface. This is the narrative. Maybe we're born with it. Maybe it's methane. In October 2015, the residents of the upscale neighborhood Porter Ranch in San Fernando Valley inhaled bad eggs and clouds. Six miles away, the SoCal Gas-owned Eliso Canyon storage facility experienced a catastrophic blowout, leaking over 97,000 tons of methane into the atmosphere, and the workers successfully sealed the site in February 2016. Methane imaginaries are slippery. 8,000 residents fled, leaving Porter Ranch a ghost town. Two schools shuttered, organs reported nosebleeds, headaches, vertigo, and respiratory distress. Yes, we know such clouds, some blasts, in fact. Yet methane is an uncanny sink of risk on landfills and in cities, in factories and in refineries, on farms and in oceans. After the Mather mine explosion, Elisa remains the worst in the country. After the Consolidated School of New York London explosion, Eliso remains the worst in the country. After the Richmond, Indiana explosion, Eliso remains the worst in the country. After the Cleveland East Ohio gas explosion, Eliso remains the worst in the country. Before the Belmont County, Ohio blowout, on which satellite Sierra shaped data mulched from metaphor, Eliso was the worst in the country. Also, Eliso. It is the age of gaslightment, tender human stomachs, burping licks, and cow plumbing. We forget such clouds and rotten eggs, folding contours of space and dirt. Yet when investigators attributed the axle rupture at Aliso to external microbial corrosions, they found something like we're nothing. In Aliso's casings, they collected a whiter zone. In California, they found our house bay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next reader is Peter O'Leary. Hello, everyone. I'm assuming you can all hear me. Yes. All right, good. Um, I'm going to read three poems for you. Um, two of which are, are in the anthology. The first is Gnostic Couplet. 
I wonder why are you playing with fire? I have uh, two poems that are connected to a place called Medewin. It's um, about an hour southwest of Chicago, where I live. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's a national tall grass prairie that's uh, operated by the, um, uh, the, the uh, U.S. Forest uh, Service. And um, uh, it's at the site of um, um, a defunct um, uh, artillery manufacturer. So uh, as a result of this company, um, when it stopped making weapons, um, it uh, uh, basically the prairie came back and uh, it's, it's a really sort of thrilling place to go. So two poems related to that. Uh, the first one is called uh, Prairie Sonnet, Medewin, and it has, um, it begins with um, an epigraph from uh, The Man of Light in Iranian Sufism by Henry Corbin. Here's the quotation. There is indeed affinity and correspondence between physical colors and auric or oral, auroral colors in the sense that physical colors themselves have a moral and spiritual quality and that what the aura expresses corresponds to it, symbolizes with it. The prairie's soteriology of light, the colors of the birds reveal, especially its yellows, sulfur-colored, amber-colored, straw-colored, buff, and its horizontal field of force, the sparrow's oracular ochres, like stains of pollens, show. The prairie's aureolin steeping the dick sisal's chevron, its fawny wings and bib of pitch offset, the meadowlark's luteous gold and bib of pitch its song, musical and slurring, ornaments. The bobolink's ink and sable domino, its wingspan in alluring ecstasy, exaggerates until the star grass tilts under its settling weight, a tug of the world. The yellow throat's witchety, 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 witch, it diagonalizes from the wild rise stem and orchard oriole's rusted chestnut breast flashes across in a fast moving outburst of flight. And then the yellow breasted chat, xanthic flame and sun, which a dozen indigo buntings and sorcel in their feathers unworldly blue oriole, foxy grasses and waxy tassels roll in waving forms of light. And my third and final poem for you all, it's called Milkweed and Thistle. Milkweed is a very common, um, very common prairie plant. It's also, uh, as some of you may know, the sole food that monarch butterflies um, use. They're specialists, milkweed specialists. They also uh, lay their eggs on the undersides of the leaves. Um, and it's kind of a super plant in the sense that uh, I have them growing out of my window here in, in our yard, and th there's a lot of milkweed out there, and, and just the, the number of species of insects that make use of this, um, this plant is really quite extraordinary. Thistle is another common, common prairie plant, and they're linked by having purplish, um, purplish flowers. The thistle, it's a little more striking. The milkweed, it's a very pale purple. Here we go. Milkweed and thistle. The carpenter bees, appealingly nimble dirigibles, pollens gathered along their belly's length, and the smaller metallic flashings of the sweet bees intent on the flowering time, and the altogether nearly black bodies of the mason bees with the pollen groomed in a furry patch on their undersides, and the incessant and purposeful explorations and probings by the honeybees of the milkweed's lavender umbelit cymes and the bumblebees audible buzz while harvesting pollen, an aura of subtle estival vibrations, so robust, so hairy, 
the garden's apiary heart. With milkweed and wild thyme, there are sage and clematis, orange asclepius and wild bergamot, daylilies and rattlesnake master, and at the center, a thistle of insistent spiky forkings crowned in dozens of violaceous pom-poms, fizzing with prospects, vigilant goldfinches, telephone and euphoric forecasts, the seeds to come. Sphinx moths purring the bee balm, cabbage whites strobing in sexual pairs, territorial monarchs and red admirals testing the nectar. Do you see it? The milkweed nourishing dozens of species of insects supplies your interior mystical life with richest nectars. And in real fact, the consequences of this phenomenon are much more far reaching to time than they are to you or you to it. The human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together. Are you prepared to face the world of this truth? Evolution is revelation in the strictest sense. You might not, because of carelessness, have the heart to see to the very end. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Strickland, you're up. Stephanie? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'll read three poems. In the first, entitled Micronesia, an islander navigating the Pacific without Western technology speaks. We follow our compass, a road in the cloud of stars, moment by moment tugging against the winds, the trades, El Nino, the doldrums. Rolling underneath us bass chords, we listen for the ocean's thrum, unfailing deep tone overtopped, overrun by local gusts, <clears throat> by distant storms. We seek rebound wavelets, picked out from delicate interval iteration, probing the sea, fingers trailing and cupped to parse them as they pass through wavering boom stretched blind in the bottom of a carved canoe, aligned with keel groove. We undo our bones ajar reed, the sea's commotion as we feel for a wave bounced back from a far yet unexplored shore. Now, half an earth away, broken ice, a shore never seen. On watch, none sleep for more than 20 minutes, world around, the surge, the rising tidal crack, overwhelms small island rafts, plunging deeper than did ever plummet sound. The knell resounding in our ear on every island, echoing unfathomed numbers. Tell us again how it comes to be we drown. Uh, a community betrayed by a world shifting all its knowledge into numbers. And what about written forms of excuse? This poem, Time Capsule Contents, features three kinds found in some future time capsule. One, sermon, what will be left? Weather, certainly. Even the ticking earth must thaw. Genetic law will prove to be present. Each stillborn defect confirmation. Murmurous, why, lords? Why this generation, this destruction of our marrow? More than all these, memory of promise her chrysalis jeans, her eyes extraordinarily bright, shadowed with mascara, honey as she was in heat, in bloom, in slow motion left 
locked in the projector. Two, transcription of outtakes from pre-trial deposition. I don't think flu should be our whole answer. Let's go over it again. Be more specific if you can. This record has to hold up for generations. We do know, Colonel, you've been ill. And you say you were misled, or did you say unnerved, by a woman selling apples who tried to stop you on your way to work. You ordered two if by land. You chose North Dakota. You swore if your right hand offend you. Is this the statement, sir, you wish to give the court? Three, a journal entry. In the shelter, I doze. I remember Indian October, an aquarium of birch leaves flowing around us slowly like nectar, home loaves, dark oven, syrup on our fingers, chrysanthemums heavy in the sugar bowl of summer. I'll close with this poem <clears throat> for Arabella who was part of the second Skylab crew in 1973. The poem is called Spun in Space. Arabella won't survive re-entry. Out here, time together, onset and end state at the border of reach, her spinnerets exude armor and trap and guideline silk. She stumbles, it tangles, then symmetry, filigree. Clinging to her thinner scaffold, swinging on a weightless hammock. Breath steps, stops, a strand of silk a floating bridge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. And our next reader is Patricio uh, Ferrari. Tarde, muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much, uh, dear editors, for having invited me to be part of this anthology to, to begin uh, uh, the first Thursday of this reading series. Uh, thank you, Cole, for putting this together. Thank you, poet friends, and every single one of you, uh, not on the other side of the screen, but here together in poetry in every single corner of the world. Uh, this, is, this is exciting, yet uh, isolated, yet exciting. And, and I am excited to, uh, to, be, uh, to be part of this uh, beautiful project and to be sharing poetry in this way which I believe will be uh, something that we will continue doing uh, more and more, uh, no, no matter what, no matter what happens. I will begin with two poems featured in the anthology that are part of uh, a trilogy that I'm still working on, titled uh, Else Here. Uh, the first volume is called Mutter Buenos Aires, M-U-T-T-E-R, Mutter Buenos Aires. And uh, the first two poems are very close to uh, to that city, uh, if you will, and that, and that culture in, in, in South America. And I will end uh, the reading with a, a Portuguese poem that I call translated. Sur. It's not the opposite of north. Cardinal compass. 180 degrees, one angle brush. Diurnal, Russell, Susurro, cardio, cardias, Greek, sun, surrender to the heart. Sur, this pouring sun, some light rains on lavender blue. It's November in every gloss, jacarandas of Buenos Aires. Sur is not the opposite of north. Cardial compass, angle brush, diurnal, cardio, surrender to the heart. 
Sur, this foreign sun, some light rains on lavender blue. Jacarandas de Buenos Aires. Render from the other's tongue what the dreaming and the dead could not eclipse. From the other's tongue what the dreaming and the dead cannot eclipse. Translation is something occurring in the past. The weather bane, jasmine, moon, this cockspurs, coral, trees, habit, pin, summer rain. Translation is something occurring in the past. Jasmine, moon, this weather vane, cockspur, coral trees, habit, pin, summer rain. The Portuguese poet that I, that, I, that I would like to share with you is Antonio Sorio. I will be reading a poem from uh, this, uh, from uh, A Luz Fraterna, the fraternal light. Uh, in the first uh, book of poems that Antonio published when he was in his 30s, Antonio is now in his mid 80s. He's very healthy in Lisbon, dividing his time between uh, beautiful Lisbon and as a town uh, south of, of the city. Um, and this poem is called uh, Despojos Jetsam. I'll read first in Portuguese and then in English. Despojos. Amarras que se lançam o fluxo das águas, despojos, limos, espraiados, cabelelos que chegam e partem como um mar, surgem os versos, e tudo de roldão, angústia, e tudo de roldão, angústia, vida e morte, oculto movimento de plantas, o equinócio do amor, que torna a noite igual ao dia, a confiança, a luta, a respiração dos homens. Jetsam, anchoring ropes tossed out to the churning sea. Jetsam and sludge maroon, mounds of sand made and unmade by shifting tides. Lines of poetry emerge, surgem os versos. And all things in a rush, anguish, life and death, hidden motion of plants, oculto movimento de plantas, the equinox of love equating day with night, o equinocio do amor que torna a noite igual ao dia, trust, struggle, and the breathing of human beings, trust struggle and the breathing of human beings, a confiança, a luta, a respiração dos homens. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rachel Blau de Plessy is next. Hi. Uh, am I unmuted properly, Cole? Okay, great. I'd like to read uh, from Around the Day in 80 Worlds, which is a notational book. And then I'd like to read the poem that's in the anthology with many thanks to all and to everybody's eloquence in thanking people. So I will just ride along on their eloquence and say thank you. As I said, it's notational and worlds should give you an idea. Folded hills, black, shining water. Flat seeming hills, grayed down water, variant green, and the destruction of a voiceless nothing island. Corporate poison dumping, being easy to offload. A flat beach, a hidden cover, toxic waste shuffled off at night. A dirty secret with an older demographic on those islands. Who could care? Who would notice? They will be dead soon anyway. If they're poisoned, so what? Nestled in the curve of an almost invisible small bay. 
I know this is a battle of the ant against the elephant, but we have to fire at least one arrow or there is no way we can face our descendants. Shozo Aki, activist on Tashima, a small island in the Sea of Japan, on residence 2003 victory as the illegal dumping by large corporations was stopped and 12 years of toxic refuse was being removed. Poetry can extend the document. Addendum, poetry might also constitute the document. My newest book is called Late Work. <laughs> Some of us may understand that title. Uh, and this is the poem that was in the anthology, but it's actually a poem in 12 parts of which I will read only the first. It's Shepherd's Calendar. And the first part, obviously, is January. That was kind of ditzy to say it that way, but you know what I mean. One, January. How alarming our life is, how it has invented ourselves almost out of existence. So the flicker is hope that we, the humans, will survive all this, finding ways to act that can hardly be predicted, much less faced. But can we, without the animals, without the insects, without the fish, without the bees? No, obviously not. But we are arriving at that spot. This endless disappearance with that veil of time disappearing around the corner hides a question. Is the thought only of trace? Are things that apocalyptic? Why is the human synonymous with hope, given everything? While at the same time, most of this mess of place has been invented and sustained by ourselves. Is it simply the technocrats whom we must re-socialize, remove? the demagogues? At least could we offer a cryptic outline of something, sending unread letters out, documenting clouds of loss? Poor planet, I pray. Oh, slightly flattened ball of clay with its heavier iron core. We its daughters, cores and sons, a chorus of the powerless and what to do in different languages yet, trying not to take a single way into the multiplicity of Janus interests nested in Vector's multifaced splay. And the last poem I'll read, um, I kind of wanted to end with the uh, Tashima one. It's more optimistic, but this one will do. We are about to drown in a flooded, burning world because it is annexed to power, to the space of awe colonized. And in that colony, the few small tears a few could shed, do not compensate for oceans sump, the plastic islands clumping, the float of choking. The fish smell plastics as if they are food. Rubble, pages, uncanny, marginalia and glosses, Ghosts, fish, have not ceased to haunt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Edwin Torres. 
Hello, everybody. Um, it's so great to be here. I have two pieces. The first is a short piece that's in the anthology, which is actually a very old piece, but I'm glad it's here and the message sort of still holds up. And the second piece is a hybrid text from this manuscript that will be published entitled The Animal's Perception of Earth. So the first piece is entitled Gum Wrapper. <clears throat> Keep your country clean, deposit trash in a country cleaner. Keep your world clean, deposit trash in a you cleaner. Keep your you clean, deposit trash in a world cleaner. Deposit trash into the world. Keep you clean, get dirty, throw you in, dirty up, repeat dirt, get clean, keep dirt, throw world in, keep your world, keep your world, keep your world. Are you willing to leave your life as you know it for the chance to change someone else's? Where have you placed yourself to be viewed by others, to be invisible? Thrust in a revolution by the stance of my strut, who can change the world? Nada. What can change the world? El viento. Cross currents, strike across the globe of flutter quakes. The passage of time is shattered by elements of nature. The life of man is shattered by that of another. Man is nature to man. Nature is nature to nature. Here's what I have for you. Here's what arrived for you. Here's what humans you. Here's what forms you. To consider earth as arrival for words to gravitate towards, to settle on timelessly gorgeous derelicts of language, to settle on the flotation devices wrapped around the layered actions that define change. What will our words do to change the earth? With the places we visit, with language, with considerations of placing, with how we own our landings. What will the motivation of ending do to change the ending to land or maybe only arrive in action of supple ability? to the human body, not compliant, not flexible, not allowed until told so, the human mind is a place inside earth, told to be earth, to be the human telling the mind to arrive. The human arrival, not pliant until given words to assemble around, to land with gentleness, the force needed for change. To strike familiarity and consideration of placement, of earth as a place in consideration of alphabet, to allow integers of cryptic consideration, their translation for creatures of cognition, to absorb intention, to allow in place the human earth its roam, for giving place what we do with time inside earth, to mind through human change, a consideration for change, to note how long it takes to set out what words do, to ignite the human out of the human, to arrive as a fuse, to note the implosion of language and how it affects our human mind. To consider the mind as a rival, to allow layered action its depth, complicity to depth. To arrange notions of human complexity as mistake-filled prones. To own our prones to action. To be prone to action and assemble abilities as triggers. To use language that implies friction as a need for change. To know that change is action out of reversal, out of what triggers implosion, to ignite revolution by writing in ways that don't arrive easy. Unaccustomed to being caught, the human mind is not earth, is not alphabet, is not a stranger to words as a place for landing. Unaccustomed to stagnant episodes of Hierarchy, the human earth is not a stranger to evolution, to the redone resonance of false implications. The human earth in mind, to the mirrored imperfections of the rendered obsolete. The human earth in mind, to the chosen arrival of disguise of arrival, to the lack of light given privilege to mount privilege. To blend with the wall, the manufactured escape of the human spirit as consideration for landing. To apprehension as sport for the human mind, to barriers invented unaccustomed to spirit, to words that absorb intention by reframing ability as punctuation liberators, to words that absorb intention by reframing ability of earth as liberty, 
in face of spirit, to allow human arrival its place by reframing place, to gravitate towards change by reframing change, to set up timelessly the human earth as a mind in consideration of arrival. Here's what frames you. Here's what knows you. Here's what saves you. Here's what serves you. We find ways to isolate truth, to isolate power, by calling on the shapes that save us, the shapes that survive us, out of brain into body. We call on our instincts to isolate hurt away from emotion, to protect our power. We call on our truth to attempt deflection out of heart. We call on our hurt to isolate deflection away from the shapes that save us. The ones that define us are the ones we call on to survive us. We call on our finding out of knowing away from doing we find ways to isolate truth. You willing to leave your life as you know it, to change someone else's, to be invisible. Thank you. Thank you. Our last reader for this session is Harriet Tarloff. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here and I'd like to thank everyone who's read so far. It's been wonderful so far. I'm going to read from the sequence called Cut Flowers, um, part of which is featured in Dispatches. The sequence is dedicated to Rachel G. Plessy, so it's great that we've been put in the same reading. Um, and I'm just going to tell you one quick thing about the poems, which is that they have one long line and then two short columns. So I'm going to read each very short poem twice in two different ways. There are two different ways you can read the poems. Um, there's 48 poems in the sequence, um, 12 in each season. Um, and I'm just going to read a few today, which move from spring to winter. They don't want anything because they haven't got a brain. Pushed wild habitat, drifted long shore in England, currents westward, thousands of years, Ice sheets, seeds in easily erodible particles, soft shingle ridges dumped. They don't want anything because they haven't got wild habitat in England. Thousands of seeds, particles dumped. Rhubarb. We take it in us arms. Footwork, fancy, footwork, slide, stepping legs, walking between stalks, candles. We don't want you people falling into it or through into spring. Persephone, maybe. Every dark birthday girl, which divided day. Rhubarb, we take it in us arms. Footwork, fancy stepping legs, stalks, candles, people into spring. Every dark divided day. Green sward line of bins at junction grazing. Residents only, gypsy horses, traders in grounds, vans and boxes, bright sheep desire. In unshorn morning, fine wedding, face on to suit smart venue, silk haired commuters, for view, cars make a U turn to see over. Green sward line of bins at junction, grazing residents only in grounds. Sheep desire fine wedding venue, for view, see over. Meridian ladder of land, just one footpath coming up against city housing. The bowers, hearing blue tits. Twitterati lodges, invasive traffic, sycamore roadies, pioneers, natives, bash them all out of teenage birches, maiden's bower, beat bypass bulldozers. Meridian ladder of land, just one footpath, housing blue tits, traffic, native birches, bulldozers. Might be a garden to get back from, out of somewhere state, struggles, tall yellow perennials, smaller pages, a little bit wilder, rarer weeds, botanical personalities. Birthwort, 300 years growing right here. 
might be a garden to get back from out of struggles, small, wilder, botanical birth words right here. Thronging to be excluded in every field division, gibberish, plantation crop down. There are lots of them, but that was that one. Horizon come down, height changed, depth, darkness, one slingering treads, decreasing circle on imagined earth. Something starts to bite neck. Thronging to be excluded in every field division. Down, that one changed, treads earth's neck. All sailing tomorrow is in doubt. Saharan winds caught up Iberian dust. He took the money in and then he passed it on again and on. Humans, they never hear eucalyptus, pine, the first fire's fight ending. All sailing tomorrow is in doubt. Saharan, Iberian, in and on again, never the ending. Three distant things that look like sheep but don't move. Forgotten things. Grey dawn, mild December. Lyric skin, cloud passing moon shows raw fields and solstice. A moment. How many nights are we staying? When luck turns, never enough. Three distant things that look like sheep but don't. Grey dawn. Lyric skin shows a moment, staying enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's our slate of readers for today. We will be having it, you know, stick around for discussion. Um, and uh, the next, there'll be another reading in the series next Thursday, same time, and watch for an update or information on the Facebook page. So I guess we're just going to open up. To everyone, right, Cole? Is that? Yes, exactly. Um, I have opened the chat room and now I'm going to um, unmute how I unmute cancel. Does yeah. that work? <laughs> Is everybody now unmuted? I don't know. I think. <laughs> Do you hear everybody? Oh, we can uh, unmute ourselves. That's probably easier. We can unmute you. ourselves. Okay, great. You're unmuted now. Well, what a wonderful reading. Thank you all so much. It was just really a great launch to the series. Huge. Huge. You can't change the difference. What you, <laughs> if you go to the very top of the chat room, it has some links for the anthology. You have to scroll up. And okay. I think Stephanie also put something... Okay. In the chat room. Oh. Yes, I think we're all still learning how to how to unmute ourselves. Am I unmuted or not? You're unmuted. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Like a question. That was wonderful. Thank you all. I want to see people. Why don't they? And then put I'm themselves on video when they go to her. Sometimes they're making dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the right, there's three pages of people to see. Yeah. Yes. Three pages of names. Yes. Yeah, yes. Right. Hmm. Oh, there are. Oh, I see. Hmm. Yeah. There's a lot there. Yeah, I'm really surprised there's so many people, but it, that's great. It's a great yeah. format to have these short readings back to back, and then we're done. That's really great. There were over 90 people during the reading itself. Yes. yes. Wow. Yes, and, and everybody, feel free to pass um, the information on, because um, it is great to have a sense of, of being together, even in this strange space. Oh, a lot of people are still muted. I wonder if, if you could just remind them again or unmute them. Well, I think I th well, maybe I think some people want to be. I don't know. Oh, well, you have to unmute everybody. 
if there's a chainsaw in the background or something or uh, okay but it's nice too to see people from a number of different and from england from different parts of this country the, the regional scope is, is ireland we're from ireland dublin and <laughs> great yay i think the furthest might be australia isn't it i think are you thinking orchid i think orchids no, in this country no i know I and, and, uh, and, 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 and Victoria. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm in melbourne oh yeah it's, mm -hmm. yeah it's it's on my 7 a.m Oh, I was wondering how, how I was really wondering what time it was there. I thought it's twelve hours, which should be horrible. <laughs> or fourteen hours, I think. <laughs> I have to get everyone up in about ten minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, it was a wonderful reading, first of all, to hear others who have paid so much attention to the other creatures of this earth and written about them so specifically and with such feeling. And Rachel's poem brought tears to my eyes. It was so humane. And Edwin's thought, would you leave your life to help the life of another and become anonymous was, uh, it really struck me too. And at least we're all doing that when we're writing poems about about these other species anyway. And um, so I kept being moved over and over again, very uh, caring, sensitive, beautiful work. Thank you. And thanks all for organizing. I was interested how everybody um, have, has, our, has our own take on human. I mean, I think as a poet, how could you not have a take on human? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the different takes on what the beyond the human. I thought that was a really interesting subtitle to mm -hmm. choose because beyond has just so many different ways it can go. Exactly. Yeah, beyond language, beyond the now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Somehow it, it seems to include stretching the, the category as well as going out beyond it. So. And that's our job, isn't it? To just, you know, to exist beyond that edge as we're people. And after another few months, we'll all learn how to discuss on Zoom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's the one thing that's still difficult to do. Well, it's strange because the audience is usually there, you know, reading. And here we are, everybody has their own is their own reading in a way. <laughs> so you can't escape from that. It was um, nice being this close. Yeah, it's it was hard enough it's having really a nice having a reading. Oops. Um, Hi. You, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I just want to say it's nice doing a reading where people's, where the reader's face is so close to me in a funny way, <laughs> you know, where there's no being in the sixth or 15th row. And I thought it was a great reading. And I also just want to put in a plug for the anthology. I was so impressed at its scope. I had no idea it was going to be that broad and that dense. So I just want to say to the editors, because it's a staggering amount of work, but I was really very impressed. And now, of course, you're doing a print edition as well. So I just want to thank you for that because um, that I haven't even begun to explore it because it's that rich. So really, congratulations on that. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I certainly want to second that. I mean, it's it's a very impressive anthology and I'm glad it will also be a print edition. Um, I just thought, did we announce Next week's readers, oh. um, I, we're losing people. So let me do that while we still have a number. So these are in alphabetical order at the moment. So uh, next week, we've got Ray Armantrout, Isabel Campos, Melissa Kswani, Alec McCallum, Kester Reed, M.G. Roberts, and Brian Tier. And if anybody wants the whole uh, 
series list, just email me at C-O-L-E-S at brown.edu and I'll mail you the whole list. I think it's on the Facebook too. It's on the Eventbrite and it's on the Facebook, I think under events, isn't it, Linda? You just type away, look. It's all right to type. It's somewhere on the Facebook page. Anyway. It's all up there. It's all up there in the chat. Right. Did anyone else hear a bird while uh, Harriet was reading? I did, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know, Harriet. Was that, was that a bird in your ecosphere? Or was it someone else's? Did someone unmute their bird? Rachel, I noticed you were unmuted during uh, Harriet's reading. Was it your no, I, bird. I, I certainly didn't mean to be unmuted. I think I just don't understand positive and negative charge here. <laughs> unmute. It, it seems a bit. I can't. I can't even. I can't even. <laughs> well, I'm reading from my shed, Linda. So I've got all. It's very hot here for England. Much hotter than usual. So I've got every window and every door open, and then I've got my bird feeders just outside. So yeah. that's actually yeah. a blackbird you heard. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for the readers. I really loved all those readings. Thank you so much. But I was wondering, was anyone reading with a, a person sitting on the other side of the screen, like in the room? Is there, it was, was anyone reading to a person in the same uh, screen? Right, I was right. reading to cats. Yeah. I was, <laughs> so I, was, I was reading to you. Oh. <laughs> a a follow-up question. I mean, I loved all those readings so much, but I, I guess I'll just ask. I can only pick on, there's only time to pick on one, but Peter, you know, your work, I'm always impressed with the energy of the language. I'm thinking sort of energia. And I was wondering, you know, those Latin words that you bring in, you kind of detonate for us. And I was wondering where, you know, that, that poem ended with something about sort of the, the, the evolution toward revelation mm -hmm. and that you know, we might not notice. But is that, you know, in an Aristotelian energia, there's a kind of telos you know, that drives it perhaps, or is there, is the revelation always sort of the the drive? You know, where does that energy come from? Nice question. Yeah, it is a good question. With that, uh, that's the milkweed and thistle poem, which appears in the anthology. And I was I was wanting to I was really wanting to list um, all of the varieties of bees in the state of Illinois that um, show up at the milkweed. So it's, there are a dozen species of bees we get in Illinois and like 11 of them um, are regular visitors to milkweed. Uh, and then I was, I was really interested in thinking of, um, well, there's a, the, the notion Jonathan, that you you alluded to is um, it was something I was actually drawing from the Jesuit paleontologist uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and so he has very much a, a, a if not a teleology, definitely it's very telic his work. It's it's moving toward the omega, and uh, you know, I was trying to think about um, um, I was trying to think about prairie habitats, Illinois is, the northern part of Illinois is, was predominantly prairie and most of it's now either farmland or suburbs. And uh, I was just thinking about that in terms of, of depredations of the various ecologies and, and thinking, are we, if, if we're anything, we have to be willing to bear witness to what it is that we've made. Like if we're not willing to look at the end, I don't know that we're we're worth anything at all. Mm. Thanks. Peter, do you think the end is sacred or secular? Uh, I mean, I'm gonna. I don't mean this answer to be flip. Um, I know. I mean, there is no secular. It doesn't exist. Just throw it out. It is sacred. If it's not, you know, to hell with the world. <laughs> Does that mean it has to be religious? Well, I don't think that I don't think that there's anything outside of of that scope for for humankind. I mean, I think we're homo religiosus. I don't I don't think that we have we have any other prospect. So um, you can take of that what you will. It it could be a moral thing. Uh, some people imagine it that way. For me, it's it's more. Um, 
Well, the, the word that I've been thinking about in relation to this is, is ecophanic, um, which is to say what happens when an environment reveals itself or manifests itself to, to humankind. Mm. I think that's our only hope. I mm. think that's our only hope. Yeah. I think the source of my question was I would probably disagree terminologically sure. um, and say spiritual or awe or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Uh, I would not agree with religiosis as the definition of humankind. Mm -hmm. That's just a way of injecting, what can I say? It's not really wanting controversy, which I really don't want, but just, just a little uh, sort of a difference of um, interpretation or outlook. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and, and I think you're pointing to what end up being either uh, semantic categories or um, just dispositional ones. I, I just happen to prefer the word religion uh, in relation to that rather than spiritual or, you know, I think, I think the numinous, all, right. it all belongs yeah, in that category. But that's, that's really just nomenclature. I don't think that I'm, I'm arguing for a doctrine or anything like that. It's not a conversation stopper. <laughs> I know, it's, often it is. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Let's just stop the conversation. <laughs> We're a, good, a good conversation starter, I think. That's really, right. really well put. The, I happen to be in my study, and the study, the books behind me are, are religion books. And when I was teaching classes, as many of us probably were during the pandemic, you know, my students would obviously be able to see, and some of them were made uneasy by like a book behind me that says Catholicism. <laughs> it fills them with fear and trembling. Like, who is this person? Well, it isn't about that. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying that. That's, uh, yeah. That's what I mean by conversation stopper. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's funny. Everyone. <laughs> yeah. person, everyone. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing to bring up about an eco-poetics audience because in this new kind of time we're living, I've been catching up reading things that I should have read 25 years ago. So I read both Buell and Cavell's writing about Thoreau. And in a way, those are the two bookends of reading Thoreau secularly slash ecosystem wise versus a kind of strange spirituality that Cavell has. So it's just interesting because I think those terms do come into this kind of work. Um, and there's a lot of different directions to one can go with that. Yeah, it's nice to know the bibliography. Edwin, can you tell us about your book, Animals for the Earth? Or something? That type, it just sounds intriguing. Uh, the Animal's Perception of Earth. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's actually, it's a sprawling sort of um, hybrid text, but I, I kind of figured out this, this sort of somewhat of a mode to combine various bits of writing, and the writing are, have all a core of animal as human and human as animal, which has been written around for a long time, but my perception to, uh, to the Earth that I was in, especially in the last few months, um, sort of is sort of settling itself into uh, the page in, in an interesting way. So anyway, um, I think the, um, it's sort of a question about, you know, the animal in us and the animal in the human and how um, we sort of don't give ourselves enough room for being animal. And maybe as humans, we have a lot of judgment in uh, what it is that we're trying to get across. So there's a perception factor. And also, I guess, the idea of poetry and language being perceptive, perception already. So um, whose perception of what is never a poem? <laughs> you know, it's always, it's always continuing to build itself and create itself. And um, I'm just capturing these bits of these voices coming in. So there's, there's a, an excerpt of that, about uh, 15 pages that will be published um, later this year. But I think it's a longer work. It's actually a longer piece that kind of goes on, um, and 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 just and it coincided with you know where we're at now with uh, what it is that we're trying to figure out, 
I was telling, talking to my son, a uh, 14 year old boy who's, who's graduating today <laughs> officially um, last week about how we were just com comparing our time, you know, between now and a few months ago, how has COVID been for you and so forth and how we were sort of just getting used to quarantine and how I liked this free fall that we were in, this unknowing, this sort of like, you know, which was just like a month ago or a month and a half ago. And how now we're a little more settled into that unknowing. We're sort of, okay, the world is not going to stop. We're going to continue. And how that sense of um, continuing is happening as it's supposed to, as it always would. But there was a moment a few, like maybe a month or a month and a half ago, where it was like, okay, what do we do now? What, where do we place ourselves? And how that doesn't happen a lot in life. How there are things that are never, you know, things have a schedule, there's a way to do things and so forth. And, and there was something kind of thrilling about the free fall. And um, anyway, I'm just kind of going on. So, the, so there's perception in that. There's, you know, the animal and the human and all that stuff. But basically it's just this idea of wondering where we're going and, and what it means to be, you know, isolated. And now that is no longer as much of a mystery. And I think poets have always been writing about isolation because we're nobody, we, we tend to kind of live in that sphere a lot. And I think the anthology actually captures a lot of that. The anthology really goes through all these different places of a place, of, you know, through the ecological um, uh, frame, but it just covers a lot of, territory around place and perception so I went a little bit there but you got it okay. Patricio I want to thank you for your uh, poem about Sur I wondered if you knew that is a famous tango with that title uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, I appreciate that. Yes, yes, I do. I, okay. I, I, I and I, I thought uh, I can picture those jacarandas. They're truly lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for your work. Well, uh, are we done for the moment? Looking forward to seeing you all next week. Mm -hmm. Thanks again to the readers. That was just such an inspiring and lovely moment. Really. Thanks to you, Cole. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks to the editors. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And Miriam uh, Bernard. Yes. Good. So long, Peter. And every, have a good week, everybody. Stay well and Bye. safe.